you to take your copy of God's Word and turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter number 13. And we're going to pick up in verse number 8 this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter number 13. And we're going to start reading in verse number 8. So when you found your place, I'd invite you to please stand with me as we read God's Word. The Bible says this in verse number 8. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. Verse number 12. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. And our last verse in, uh, is verse number 13. And the Bible says this, So now faith, hope, and love abides, these three. But the greatest of these is love. Uh, let's go to the Lord and pray. Lord, thank you for giving us this time today, the break in our week, to be able to come and designate time to come together as a church family. Uh, Lord, thank you for a good pattern in which you give to us, six days of work and one day of rest. I pray we would make the most of this day, that we would stop mentally trying to do more things and help us to rest in your word, to rest in the gospel. It's already been finished. It's already been completed. Help us to think through these things uh, today. Uh, help us to rest physically and to rest and, and, and really to gather with the church and to be refueled for another week of work. Um, Lord, this is a good pattern, and we just want to thank you for that before we go on. Uh, Lord, I also want to thank you for allowing us to get this far into 1 Corinthians. Uh, thank you for allowing us to complete this chapter today on love, and I pray that you would use this passage that is oftentimes misinterpreted by so many preachers, uh, really to draw us back to what you meant when you had Paul write this down. Uh, help us to see really the aspects and characteristics of love that you desire, and help us to uh, or just purge out any false ideas which people have taught in the past, especially with this passage. Um, Lord, guide us through your spirit and help us to see really the importance of love that, that may have never been emphasized until we've got to this place in Scripture. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right, church family, you can be seated. Whenever we come to God's Word, whether it be in our quiet time or, or teaching through a passage, Many times I like to ask, why is this here? Why is this important? Uh, what did the author mean whenever this was written down? Uh, this is here for a reason. This is included in Scripture for a reason. So why is it here? And so as I began to ask that question, as I studied this passage, um, I really had to start looking back of, in history, really looking at the church of Corinth. As I began to do this, I began to remember, hey, the church of Corinth was a real living and breathing church. This isn't a made-up church. What we read this morning was a real letter written to a real church that had real problems. And so when we look at this passage in light of that, we can understand that the church of Corinth was living opposite of being a loving church. This was an unloving church. This is a church that still had a lot of problems, it still had a lot of issues. They were still struggling with pride. They were still pro struggling with selfishness. They were unloving. They were a divided church. They lived in a wicked city. God called this church there at Corinth to be salt, but instead they're being salted by the outside. They're being salted by Corinth, the outside city. And so the main problem that we're looking at here this morning and really, you could trace every problem that Paul addressed in 1 Corinthians to a lack of love. The reason why this was written, what we just read, is because it was a church in a community that was not loving uh, the congregation, 
inside, but they were also not loving the people on the outside. So let's begin in verse number 8 together. Let's, let's read that again. The Bible says this, love never ends. Those are just three words, but the rest of our time this morning and the rest of the verses in chapter 13 is a microscope of those three words. Love never ends. So when you think about love never ending, everything else that we're going to talk about this morning is zeroed in. Think of a microscope. We're going to see all the details of love never ending. So let's break this down. Some of your translations in verse number 8 may say love never fails. Your translations may say love never falls or love never ends. The literal meaning of love never ending, it means this. Love uh, never collapses into decay. That's what, in the original language, that's what it means. Love never collapses into decay. You may say, well, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Think of a flower. You guys have seen a flower before. It's beautiful. But a flower eventually begins to fall into decay. The petals on that flower, what happens? It dies and it falls the ground begins to decay. The Bible says love does not do that. Love outlasts everything else. In fact, look in your Bibles at verse number 13. The Bible says this, so now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. Verse number 13 gives us three uh, virtues, faith, hope, and love. But love will outlast faith, love will outlast hope, love will outlast everything. How? How will love, because verse 8 says love never ends, how will love outlast these other virtues found in verse number 13? Well, faith will eventually disappear. Faith will disappear whenever our faith is turned to sight. You will not have faith faith in heaven, because you will have sight. Love outlasts faith. What about hope? Hope will disappear when all is fulfilled. We'll no longer have hope, because everything will be fulfilled. Is everybody tracking with me so far? Do you see how verse number 8 is connected to verse number 13? Love is the one thing that does not change because of death. Love does not change because of eternity. So, again, the reason why I point this out before we even get to our first point is there have been so many teachers over the years that have taken verse number 8, let me read it to you again, love never ends. And instead of taking that passage and drawing out what the author wants us to know, they take their worldly ideas and place it on verse number 8. We call that isogenesis instead of exegesis. So, again, when we get to verse number 8, understand that you can't use this verse to say, well, love will triumph over all problems, or it'll, it'll triumph over all trouble. That wasn't Paul's point in writing this passage about love. See, we do see uh, experiential love fail. Marriages fail. Relationships fail. Love fails even within the church. You can't take this verse and just slap it on something at Hobby Lobby and say, well, love never, love never ends. That's, that's the way our secular culture reads into this verse, but it's simply not what Paul means. True love, love as a reality, lasts forever. It's not, it doesn't end at death. It continues on. What Paul's saying in verse number 8, let me, let me continue to press forward. Paul is saying this. It will never disappear when compared to other things that will disappear. Let's keep reading verse number 8, and I'll explain this to us. The Bible says this, love never ends. And then he contrasts in the very next words with things that will end. He says, as for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. See, the church at Corinth, remember, they're unloving. What did the church at Corinth love? They loved their selves. They loved their reputation. 
They love their spiritual gifts. And so Paul takes the three gifts that the church of Corinth just loved, and he contrasts them to something that is lasting. He says, hey, you're focusing on temporary things. You're, you're focusing on speaking in tongues. You're, you're focused on speaking, on preaching. But those things are only temporary things, which leads us to our first point. Number one, spiritual gifts are temporary. Preaching and proclamation will one day cease to exist. It's a gift. There are some people within the church that have been gifted with that gift, and it's, and it's important here and now that gift belongs to the earth, but eventually the earth will pass away, and so will preaching and proclamation. In fact, go back in your Bible to chapter number 12, verse number 31. Let me show you how the church of Corinth is emphasizing the temporal gifts instead of the eternal gifts. Verse 31, and to be honest with you guys, I don't like the way our English translations translate verse number 31. I'm going to read it, and then I'm going to explain what it means in the Greek. It says, but earnestly desire the higher gifts. A better translation is this. You earnestly desire the showy gifts. But I show you a far more excellent way. The church of Corinth desired the showy gifts. It was all about them. It was all about their reputation. It was all about their status. And so Paul picks out, in verse number 8, three of those showy gifts. Number one, I'm going to explain to you. I'm going to have visitors this morning that haven't been tracking with us in 1 Corinthians. Let me explain what prophecy is in the Bible. Biblical prophecy was the ability to speak for God. So God would speak to a man, and that man would convey the message that God gave him. Now, this was an important gift in the early church. Remember, the church of Corinth didn't have the New Testament. They had to, the Lord had to speak to someone, and then they had to write it down and then deliver it to the church. It's an important gift, but it was a temporal gift. What about knowledge? They promoted the gift of knowledge. Knowledge is not just knowing a lot of stuff. Biblical knowledge is knowing things that only God can give you. It's knowing biblical knowledge. Also, another gift that they promoted instead of love was the gift of tongues. Notice all three of these gifts up on your screen, and in verse number 8, are all speaking gifts. They're out in public. What is the gift of tongues? The gift of tongues is being able to speak in a language that you never learned. That is the gift of tongues. A language unlearned by the speaker. So what is Paul's point? Verse number 8. All three of these gifts are important, but they're temporary. They don't last forever. Look at verse number 8. The Bible says, love never ends. It, it continues on. But as for prophecies, they will pass away. This word pass away here uh, is a Greek word. It's used four times in verses 4 through 11. And it literally means this. Will pass away literally means will be set aside. It shall be stopped. So prophecies, the ability to speak for God will stop. It's a passive verb. Something will bring it to an end. So some of these gifts that the church of Corinth was investing all their time and resources in would eventually stop. That they would eventually be stopped. It's a passive verb. But love, it would never stop. So Paul's emphasizing, hey, that's what you need to invest your time in. Let's keep look at verse number 8. It says, as for prophecies, they will pass away. That's the Greek word that we just talked about. And then it goes on to say, as for tongues, they will cease. That's a different word there. It's the Greek word palhu. It literally means this. It will cease by itself. Tongues will cease by itself. The subject plays a role in the action. So what's the point? What you're saying, bro, chaps, I don't, I don't understand. I'm, what's going on here? Paul is showing us in this passage what we need to emphasize within the local church. 
And that's love. Not showy gifts. Not teaching and, and promoting one pastor over another or doing this or doing that. That's what he said to the church of Corinth. He says, you need to promote love. Now, let's dig into this just a little bit more because uh, can, where our church is located, uh, all the different uh, denominations around us, this would be helpful for us to know. In this passage, it says, as for tongues, they will cease. Now, why is that important for us today? important to us because there's a lot of folks that never got that last part of verse number 8 that they will cease. They will be brought to an end. Why is, when will tongues cease? How will they cease? Well, the gift of tongues was a gift that was given to the apostles. It was given uh, the gift of tongues and languages. In fact, Hebrews chapter 2 verse number 3 says this. How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders. What he's talking about there is the gift of tongues. It was given to the apostles by gifts of the Holy Spirit, distributed according to his will. Now, I wanted to get into some tracing of when the... Uh, when the gift of tongues, the gift of languages cease. But we're going to talk about that more in the next two weeks. So I'm just going to give you a brief overview. One of the last speaking in tongues recorded by one of the apostles was in A.D. 58. Um, and that was recorded in Acts chapter 28. Uh, 2 Corinthians 12, 12 says this, The signs of a true apostle were performed among you with utmost patience, with signs and wonders, and mighty works. So miracles, uh, the gift of tongues, was really limited to a certain time period in history for a certain purpose. It was never to bring, the gift of tongues was never intended to bring man glory, but instead to give God glory. Much of the tongues that we see today draws attention to a man or a woman instead of focusing on advancing the gospel. Tongues was given in order that people that couldn't hear the gospel in their language would be able to hear it supernaturally. It would be as though, well, we're not even going to get into that. Someone would be able to speak the gospel in a language they never learned. God used that as a gift to advance his church and to advance his kingdom. But that has ceased. We'll talk about that more next week. Um, so, number one, Spiritual gifts are temporal. Number two, if you're taking notes this morning, also see that gifts are partial. Where do we see that at? Let's read verses 9 and 10. The Bible says, For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. What, what's he saying there? I mean, this is like, in many people's minds, this almost sounds like gibberish. What is, what's Paul saying here? Paul's saying when the perfect comes, there will be no need of some of these spiritual gifts. They have no purpose. Again, look at verse 9. He says, for we know. Paul's including himself in that. He's saying, yeah, there's, there's a reason for us to have knowledge right now. There's a reason for us to have the gift of preaching and teaching. But eventually, those will have no purpose. Again, the church of Corinth did not understand this. They wanted that gift of teaching and preaching. They, they held on to it as tight as they could. They, they loved having the gift of knowledge. And they told everybody else that they had the gift of knowledge. But Paul calls them out in verse number 9 and 10. He says, even if you have the gift of knowledge, you're still limited in your understanding of the truth of God. He's the one that reveals the truth. And in fact... Paul would later say to the church at Rome in Romans chapter 11, verse 33, he said, Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has become his counselor? That's helpful for us to remember. And that would have been helpful for the church of Corinth to 
how unsearchable. Our minds can't exhaust the truth of God. But all that's, that's going to pass away. Knowledge is going to pass away. Look at verse 10. We're almost through this, guy. I know that I know this is this is some deeper things. Bear with me in verse 10. It says, But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. Alright, so what are the partial? That's the spiritual gifts like knowledge, wisdom, preaching, and teaching. Those are going to pass away when the perfect comes. Here's the question. What is the perfect? He keeps saying when the perfect comes, these spiritual gifts are going to pass away. What is the perfect? Well, let's dig in. Let's look and see what the perfect is. The perfect is the eternal heavenly state of believers. There's a lot of speculation out there of what the perfect means, but the perfect is biblically the eternal heavenly state of believers. Spiritual gifts are only given here on earth, but love will last for all eternity. When, so we look forward to the perfect. When will we experience the perfect? When will we experience the eternal heavenly state of being a believer? Well, let's backtrack. Old Testament saints experience the perfect. That will begin at the first resurrection, when they will be raised to be with Him forever. Old Testament saints, that's when they will experience the perfect. What about us Christians today? For a Christian, the eternal state begins either at death, the moment you breathe your last, or when Christ comes back for his church at the rapture, when he takes his own to be with himself. There's another group of people, I'll just add this in, we're going to talk about this another day, but for tribulation and kingdom saints, it will occur at death or glorification. If you don't understand that, we're going to get to it eventually. So, just to review, number one, spiritual gifts are temporal. Number two, gifts are partial. Now, number three, spiritual gifts are elementary. Look at verse number 11. I always wondered what this verse meant, but when we look at it in its context, it makes more sense. Let's read it together. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. What Paul is saying is he's illustrating the perfect. He says, when the perfect comes, Christians are going to be different. On earth, we as Christians are like a child in our understanding of the things of God. But in the eternal, whenever we go to be with Christ, whether at death or the rapture, that perfect is going to be made complete. All those things we wondered, all those things we did not understand, it will then make sense. All the immaturity, all the childishness that we have here on earth, all our imperfections, all our limits of understanding and knowledge will be gone. That's what verse number 11 means. The perfect, that's something we look forward to. And there's, there's a lot of things that I just do not understand. There's things that I've studied for years and years and but our hope is that when the perfect comes, we'll, we'll be able to understand those things as God intends. All right. Verse number 12. We're almost done. It says, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So Paul says, even right now, with God's Word, with God's Spirit, it's though we're looking into a mirror, and we can see very dimly. It's not super clear. But when we enter into God's presence, we shall see Him face to face. We will see things so much clearer than we do on this side of heaven. All right. This is our last point. Number four, love is eternal. Look at verse number 13. So now, faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Again, Paul is emphasizing love. 
In heaven, there will be no need for faith and hope. Why? Because everything true will be known, everything good will be possessed. That hope and faith will have no purpose. Love is greater than those two things. Why? Because it's eternal. Let me explain a little bit more. When you think about hope, when you think about faith, those are good things. But love is even greater. Why? Because love is more godlike than hope and faith. How? Think about this for a second. God doesn't have faith. God doesn't have hope. But the Bible says in 1 John chapter 4, verse number 8, that God is love. So love is the supreme example and characteristic of a holy God. What does this mean for us? Well, the same thing it means for the church of Corinth. Some of us in this room may be tempted to promote temporal things or promote certain abilities or characteristics in our life at the expense of the glory of Christ. Maybe we're so focused on our ministries or our agendas that it comes at the cost of love, loving our fellow church member, loving our community, failing to reach, to teach, and to encourage. So many times we're investing in gifts, ministries, faith, hope, and all these things one day will cease to exist, but love continues. Are we showing love? I mean, the church of Corinth wasn't. They were everything but love. Are we practicing love? Are we living love? Because that is what's most important. I think for me, as I land the plane here this morning, as I was studying on my own for this sermon, I think the Lord really impressed me about how important it is to love. Many times I emphasize the temporal. But clearly in this passage, God shows us that love is far greater than these others. Am I emphasizing the temporal or the eternal? Are we cultivating love within fellowship? Could you honestly say Raymond Baptist Church is marked by love. When visitors come in, would they say that is a loving church? They reached out to me. They become involved in my life. They brought us in. They leaned into us. Or would they say, man, they're just so consumed with their self and their own ministries. They can care less. Moving beyond the local church, what about your home? Is your home marked and emphasized by love? Or would you say, like the Church of Corinth, I'm being, I'm being influenced by so many other things besides God and His Word. Uh, there is no love in our house. We're constantly at each other's throat. We're constantly seeking our own ways. We're constantly seeking our own agendas. It's selfish. You see, when we come across verse number 8, the world says, oh, love never ends. But what they forget is that's not talking about ex experiential love. That's talking about God's love. Experiential love does fail. People fall in and out of love all the time. You see, the world puts forward this view of love as, let me just shoot straight, then I'm going to an invitation. Love today in our world is this. I love myself and I want you. When we use the word love today, like I love that person, what we're really saying, guys, is this. I love myself and I want you. But that's not the kind of love that's been described in our study here in 1 Corinthians chapter number 13. True love is eternal. 
and the basis of love, the driving component of love is God. It's, a, it's an overflow out of a work that's happening in our heart. I invite you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Lord, we're coming to you now. Uh, really, Lord, I'm coming to you now. Because so many times I get caught up in the very same things that the church of Corinth did. Just the idea this morning of preaching on love caused my heart to sink. Because Lord, we've already talked about it. We've spent weeks talking about love. But there I, I find myself, just like the church of Corinth, being uh, boasting in my knowledge. I already know this. And yet here you are, Lord just humbly describing to us, no, you think you know what love is, but, but Lord, you just completely, radically just showed us what true biblical love is. Lord, thank you for cultivating my heart a teachable spirit. I pray you would have used this message this morning to encourage your church some of these passages, we think we know what it means. Help us to look back and study and draw out the gems and the nuggets of knowledge that you have hidden for us to be revealed by your Spirit. Uh, Lord, I do pray just in a very simplistic way that you would cultivate it in my heart and within this church a heart to love, to love others more than ourselves, to love you first and foremost. I think if we're honest here this morning, Lord, we would all confess that there's other things that many times compete with our love. We love so many other things besides you. We love our toys. We love our possessions. We love our comfort. We love our food. But Lord, I pray you would help us to sort through our priorities and help us to love you first and foremost. To, as Matthew 6.33 says, to seek first the kingdom of God and your righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Lord, I'm asking as we go to a moment of invitation, if there's folks here this morning that have not been loving, or maybe they've had a wrong view of love, they've been viewing love as loving self, where you would confront that, help us to internalize it, and move on. It's in Jesus' name we pray.